come get into God's Word and open it up a little bit um, and uh, celebrate New Year's. Y'all know it's New Year's today? Does anybody know that it's New Year's today? Today, um, and, and it's, an, it's a different occurrence. Sometimes it's a two-day celebration. Sometimes it's a, a one-day celebration, but it begins with the new moon in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. Um, and it's called, anybody know? Besides the name? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Uh, the Feast of the Trumpets. And the trumpet uh, in especially Old Testament times was a pretty significant thing. Now they had these things. Y'all you know, have seen some of this before, right? Shofar. Shofar. Um, it's a ram's horn. I tried to figure out, you know, did it go on this I couldn't figure out how it went on. Um, but this this is a, a real shofar, and it's about the size of the ones that are that are most commonly used in Jewish circles today. Um, there are a lot that are used, um, uh, a lot of uh, the more charismatic churches especially like to use them in their worship times, and they'll use ones that have two and three pearls on them, but those things are like big time expensive and way out of my budget. But uh, Feast of Trumpets, it, it's, it's told um, in, in Leviticus chapter number 23 uh, that uh, they're supposed to have this feast of trumpets. It's also uh, found in Numbers 29, but in, in Leviticus 23 beginning in, in verse 23, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, so this is when the, the law is getting given, the law's coming and, and uh, Moses is going to be given it and this is what Moses said. Speak to, or this is what God said to Moses in verse 24, Leviticus 23. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month of the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing the trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on that day, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And when we look over in Numbers, it gets even more specific. But this one here in Leviticus is the initiation of what's known as the Feast of the Trumpets. And uh, at, at the end uh, of our time today, I'll, I'll show you some, some more specific things to help draw this together. But basically, the feasts and festivals in the Jewish calendar kind of get split up between the two harvest times. We've got the early harvest and the latter harvest, and this one is, is in the, the latter harvest. And they're called to bring some of the gain of that latter harvest to, um, to worship the Lord with and to bring as, uh, as an offering to the Lord and to make as a sacrifice to the Lord, and they're to blow the trumpet. And, and the trumpet has always been used either to mark a celebration, to sound a warning, or to call a congregation together. And in this case, it's to call a congregation together so that during this feast, we begin then the week uh, or 10 days of awe, A-W-E, uh, recognizing and knowing who God is. And next Wednesday, the way it falls on the calendar this year, next Wednesday is the highest of holy days among the Jewish calendar. It is Yom Kippur. Next Wednesday will be that day. The day when the high priest, the only day that the high priest would go in, the, the main sin offerings for all of the year would be brought in and given, and that spotless red heifer that they keep looking for, all of the things that were necessary for that. And, and the high priest would take, uh, wearing bells on his garments, and some, some accounts say with a, a rope tied around his waist just in case he messes up in there. And he would take some of the blood from the... The, the sacrifice and take it to the mercy seat, which is the covering of the box that they carried around. Remember that box that they carried around? What was it called? Say it. The Ark of the Covenant, right? And uh, we could even get more specific and talk about the tablets, the Ten Commandment tablets in there, and some manna was in there, and the rod of Moses or Aaron was in there. I think that's all that was in there. Am I missing something? Um, but And then there's a covering on top of that box. It's called the mercy seat. Two angels. Uh, I would love to have seen the original. I've seen renderings of it from uh, the way that our artists would put it together. But two angels sitting on the mercy seat facing one another, representing the presence of God. And the high 
high priest would take the blood of the sacrifice on Yom Kippur next week and sprinkle it seven times on that mercy seat. And just in case he messed up inside the Holy of Holies, they had a, a way to retrieve him. If the bells quit jingling at the end of his garment, uh, then they would know probably need to pull him out. But to begin that celebration, to call the people together, they would blow the trumpet. Um, there in verse number 24, um, uh, in, the, in the seventh month, first day, have a Sabbath rest. Whatever day of the week that ends up on, have a Sabbath rest. This was also uh, the day that the year of Jubilees would begin and all of that, um, if it was the proper year. A memorial blowing of the trumpets and a holy convocation, bringing the people together and beginning this sacrifice, moving toward the highest of holy days, which in our case, in our calendar, because this actually started, uh, Rosh Hashanah actually started Monday evening, and as the sun goes down tonight, it's over. You Sometimes it's just over a one-day period, a 24-hour period. This time, it, it, I don't know why or how, but it came up over a 24-hour period. And so they would get the shofar, and they would blow the shofar. In contemporary circles, the shofar is blown a hundred times and or a hundred notes um, in, in that day, calling everybody together. And uh, they would, they would, everybody would recognize it. There were two kinds of trumpets. There was this. There was also the silver trumpets that the priests used. They're, they're resembling the long trumpets that you see, you know, when they're, here comes the king. You know, uh, those, those long silver straight trumpets. Uh, they would use those too for special occasions. But this is what they started out with, and it, it sounded something like this. Kill my mic for me for just a minute. Or something like that. <laughs> we'll be right back after this commercial. <laughs> So they would blow that at least a hundred notes, maybe a hundred times. There were four different kinds of, of sounds that they would make with their shofar as they would call the people to this holy convocation. And they would not just blow the horn any old way and bring any old offering. If you look over in, in Numbers chapter 29, beginning in verse 1, Numbers 29 beginning in verse 1, you're going to find that God gets a little more specific with them about how they're to celebrate this time that leads them to come and begin their new year. And uh, verse, verse 1 of chapter 29 of Numbers says this, And in the seventh month of the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. For you, it is a day of blowing trumpets. In, in the numbers place, the Hebrew there can, can be for making shouts instead of blowing trumpets. And so um, we'll get to that in a minute, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Verse 2, you shall make a burnt offering as a sweet aroma to the Lord. One young bull, one ram, seven lambs in their first year without blemish. The grain offering shall be fine flour mixed with oil. Three tenths of an ephah for the bull. An ephah is a, is a measurement. Um, two tenths for the ram. One tenth for each of the seven lambs. And so uh, there we have eleven tenths going right now. Also one kid of the goats as a sin offering to make atonement. For you, This was all about atonement. This was all about being close to God again. Besides the burnt offerings with his grain offering for the new moon, the regular burnt offering with his grain offering, and their drink offerings according to their ordinance as a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. So this was not just some willy-nilly day that you come together and if you happen to have $2 bills in your pocket, then you give $2 and that's your offering. For, or if you just you know, happen to have an old, an old goat laying around, you bring that old goat up and he can, no, it has to be the best. And it has to be the young ones. And it has to be the right ones. And it has to be the right amount of, 
of the grain offering, and the, and the grain just not you know scoop it up. It's ground grain. It's the flour, and it's mixed with oil. And so not only do we have to grind the flour, but we've got to press the oil. And and you can see how you can see how just to bring these offerings was a huge deal to be able to bring all of this together and each person to bring their part of this offering so that uh, it, the people could be reminded that we need to get close to God. At this, at this particular time, the Jewish New Year, and, and, and I'm looking at a, a document from, um, it, it, it's called uh, uh, Judaism 101, JewFAQ.org is the website that I pulled some of this from. The observance significance was for the new year. This is the new year. This was not the only new year. We'll, we'll talk about that too, but this was the new year. The observances were mostly from the, the sounding of a horn and the bringing of the offerings. Two days or one day. Um, one of the great customs that they did, it sounds good to me, dipping apples in honey to remind of the sweetness of God and, and his, his love in forgiving our sins. And then also casting sins into the river. And uh, um, I'm not going to try to say it, but Lou Ann's going to say it for us. The customary greeting for Rosh Hashanah is? Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Um, there's an L in front of it in my, book, in my paper. I don't know why. Uh, if for a good year or may your year be good, can you be healthy and whole and complete? And, and, and the, the, the Shana has a similar root. I read this to Shalom, the completeness. Um, and so uh, you're not just saying, Happy New Year. You're saying, uh, in this year, may you be complete. May it be fine for you. May it be well for you and your family. Am, am I getting the... Does, does it say something about you and your God? Yeah. Because the, I mean, the whole point is to say we're going to get closer to God and we're going to get, uh, we're, we're going to, you know, confess ourselves. And we're coming right up here on Yom Kippur. We're going to, in 10 days uh, from the beginning of this thing, which was Monday, uh, we're going we're gonna to send the high priest in to give the main atonement offering for us inside the Holy of Holies. We've got to get ready for this. And we got to think about uh, a lot of things. One video that I watched in preparation for this said uh, that uh, they take time to think about who's going to live and who's going to die during this year. Because there's going to be some people die this year. I mean, not, not in specific, or this, this person's name. But they consider the reality that people will die this year. And they consider the reality that people will live this year. So how are we going to live if by chance we're one of those that's going to die this year and if by chance we're one of those that, that will live this year? Where are we going to live and, and how are we going to be? This, this whole New Year thing was, was, was not just a, a moment for them uh, like we have, um, you know, at, at, at 12 o'clock on December 31st, midnight. You know, the ball comes down there on the top of the building in New York City and the fireworks go off in London and, and all of that. And everybody, you know, gets drunk, eats black eyed peas and kisses somebody. I mean, you know, that's what we do, right? And, and we make a resolution. I'm going to lose some weight this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit talking so mean about my neighbor this year. So, you know, whatever. Um, uh, one of my kids one year made a New Year's resolution that she was, see, I've just narrowed it down to two, that she was going to gain a quarter inch, make it up to five feet tall. And she did. And <laughs> so, um, you know, but we, we do that kind of thing in, 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 in those years. On Rosh Hashanah, it says uh, in, in uh, the, the Jew, Judaism 101 website, on Rosh Hashanah, uh, this is written from an Orthodox Jewish point of view to Orthodox Jews. Okay, so that's uh, this paragraph and things I'm going to read in the next few minutes will be from that point of view. On Rosh Hashanah, we renew the crowning of God as sovereign of time and space. Melech Ha'alom. Did I say that right? Melech Ha'alom or whatever. Olam, Olam, that was what it is. And renew our relationship with him with celebration and blasts of the shofar. This theme is seen in the popular prayers and songs of the, of the time. 
and these events continue even in the literature or the liturgy for Yom Kippur. Uh, there's one important similarity, and it has to do with those New Year's re resolutions uh, between the American New Year and the Jewish New Year. Um, it's that we plan to make a better life. We don't go into the New Year saying, well, another year. Well, I guess some of us do now. Um, but normally we don't. We, we go into this New Year saying, uh, especially as Christians, and, and in, in their case, as believers in God, we want to be closer to Him. We're going into this New Year with this celebration that's going to last most of this 28-day month. That's how long the months are in the Jewish calendar. And we want to be closer to God when it's over. We want our life to be more meaningful for his purpose in us before, before it, 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 it's over and done. Uh, he says many Americans use the new year as a time to plan a better life, making resolutions. And likewise, the Jewish new year is a time to begin introspection, looking back at the mistakes of the past year. And planning the changes to make in the new year, continuing through the days of awe and Yom Kippur. And so um, it, it, it becomes not just a holiday to celebrate, but it becomes a, a moment to say, I want my life to be more significant under the power and the might, and even in Old Testament times, the kingdom of God. Remember, uh, just before Jesus ascended, his disciples, are you going to establish your kingdom now? We're looking for this kingdom. And the Jews continued looking for their kingdom. And each time Rosh Hashanah would come around, they would hope that this is going to be the time that that new Messiah would come and establish the kingdom. And he would be a military leader taking dominance over the whole world. And that he would be a political leader ruling and leading the world in goodness and kindness and love and mercy. And that he would be a, a religious leader drawing them close to him and showing them his grace and his kindness. They were looking for that. And every year at Rosh Hashanah, they want their life to be more meaningful because they know that the kingdom of God is coming very closely. The one that Jesus said is at hand. And so they continued to uh, look and continue to want to see uh, what's going on concerning uh, the institution of it. We've read the scripture, Leviticus 23, uh, verses 23 to 25, and the uh, passage there in Numbers that made it a little bit more particular about exactly how to worship it. And then the shofar, and this was an interesting thing. It might not be interesting to maybe four of us in the room, but um, that, that's okay. Tammy and, and uh, myself and, and our trumpet player back there, Carl, um, uh, we, 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 can, we can enjoy this. this so y'all don't have to listen to this part, but um, it, it says a total of 100 notes were sounded each day, either the two or the three days. And there are four different types of shofar notes. Uh, uh, the tekiah, I don't know if I said that right, but it's a three-second sustained note. The shagarim, a three one-second notes rising in tone. Uh, the teruah, a series of short staccato notes ending in a period of about three seconds. Like that. And the... Uh, the gedola, which is whatever, I don't know if I said that right, literally the big tekia, the final blast in the set, which lasts, the writer thinks, 10 seconds minimum. And uh, there are some YouTube videos you can go to and you can look if you want to hear better examples of the shofar playing. There's one I listened to today just because I thought it was good, a guy that plays in the New York Philharmonic, and usually he's the trumpet player there, but he got a shofar around and, and said that that's what it is. No work is permitted on the day. Uh, much of the day is at the synagogue um, doing the regular liturgy of a Sabbath. A special prayer book, though, is read in place of the normal prayer book from that day. And uh, there is an extensive liturgy of, of work of prayers and scriptures that are supposed to be read uh, for this whole season of saying, and, and here again, this is what it's saying. Let's get closer to God. Let's make our life more meaningful to God this year than our life was last year. Two of the, of the um, big things that families would do together, one is the eating apples dipped in honey, a symbol of our wish for a sweet new year. 
And the second uh, was, um, uh, what's it called? Up on the next page, no wonder I can't find it. It's called the Tashika, or Tashik. Uh, it means casting off. And, and, and he says, uh, quote, we walk to a water such as a creek or a river and empty our pockets into the river, symbolically casting off our sin. Small pieces of bread are commonly put into the pocket to cast off. This path practice is not discussed in the Bible, but it's a longstanding custom uh, that they do to show that we, we need to get rid of our sin. And I, and I like customs like that. I don't know about you guys. Um, but I, I like things that, that have a symbolism to them that, that show what's happening, um, like taking something and casting it away. Uh, to show that we're casting off our sin, and just for just just for uh, purposes of making sure we understand where we are, five thousand seven hundred and eighty-two times Rosh Hashanah has been observed. This is the year in the Jewish calendar five seven eight two, and next year it'll be at the end of September instead of the beginning of September because it has to do with the new year. Are you seeing the, the significance of the Feast of Trumpets? And, and the Feast of Trumpets, uh, Mark, and, and now I'm, I'm looking at an, another uh, website, it's called gotquestions.org, and, and I don't, I'm not telling you that these are the best websites to find, but I found good information here to share with you. Um, the Feast of Trumpets marked the beginning of 10 days of consecration and repentance before God, and it's one of seven Jewish feasts or festivals appointed by the Lord one of three that occur in the autumn. The Feast of Trumpets began on the first day of New Moon. And we've already been through all of that. It's called Rosh Hashanah. The head of the year. The beginning point of the calendar. And, and, and it's important. Uh, this writer says it's important for a few reasons. One, it commemorates the end of the agricultural festival year. So we got an end of the you know, harvest festival, if you will. Um, also, the Day of Atonement fell on the 10th day of the month. And so as this begins on the first and ten days later, Day of Atonement, and we've we've talked about that. The festival of booths that begins on the fifteenth day, the blowing of trumpets heralds the solemn time of preparation. There was so many things going in to bring in the the, the days of awe, the ten days of repentance, or the days of awe. Uh, the trumpet sounded. It, it was an alarm that can be understood as a call to introspection and to repentance. One of the things that I have to bring to our attention as we look at this, this holiday that, that there, it's actually today in, in the Jewish calendar and, the, and uh, Jewish observers are, are observing this today. They're blowing the trumpets in some places even right now as the sun's going down to, to close the Rosh Hashanah celebration and open the days of awe. Uh, as they're doing that, they're, they're, they're saying we want to repent. We want to look deep inside of ourselves. I'm not, I'm not looking to say how many things Roger needs to repent for. Roger figured that out all by himself. I'm looking for stuff Steve needs to repent for. But we've got something better. Because we don't have to bring a bull and seven rams and lambs and whatever, all that stuff that I read off of there. Because we have the Messiah who's coming. died on the cross for my sin and for your sin. And that makes this new year all the better because as this new year approaches, I know that I don't have to do this repenting thing today knowing that it's just going to be done today and tomorrow I'm guilty again. Quick, quick as I have a bad thought, I'm guilty again. Quick as I talk mean about my neighbor, I'm guilty again. As, as quick as I, uh, just whatever it is, uh, I'm guilty again. And not only am I guilty again, but I'm responsible for that sin. And I, I'm responsible under the law for that sin because the sacrifice is good for everything in the past. But when the perfect sacrifice came, when that which is perfect has come, Corinthians tells us, then that which is impossible Heart shall be done away with. And this is in part, and we, they have to do it again next year. 
and they'll do it again next year. And so next year, they'll do it for the, the 5,783rd time. And the next year, if the Lord tarries 507,084, the next year, 5785, and 5786. But somewhere along about 3760-ish, I don't know what year it was exactly, but about 2,000 of these years ago, Jesus hung on a cross, shed his blood, perfect sacrifice. God said he commends his love toward us this way, that while we're still sinners, Jesus died for us. And Jesus said, whosoever believes in him has faith in him. Not just with inner introspection so I can know what to be sorry for when the priest goes into the Holy of Holies, but so that I can know that the Holy of Holies has now been opened and I can stand before that myself and know that God has forgiven me of my sin through the work of Jesus Christ. We got something better. My, my prayer, my heart for our, our dear friends who are observing the Jewish holiday today, Rosh Hashanah, is that they would know that Yom Kippur has lost its significance because of Jesus being on the cross. And that they don't have to wait for Yom Kippur each year to be forgiven and have their repentance accepted. That they can do that any moment of any day. And that they can come to the Father and he'll accept them. Not just at the head of a new year, Rosh Hashanah. But any time that they'll turn their hearts toward him. Oh, that we would keep that in mind and make that a part of who we are and, and, and what we know. Well, this feast is not mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, however, Yom Kippur is in Acts chapter 27. We can see it there. Um, but the, the trumpet blasted. And, and just by the way, just, just, just by the way, there's another trumpet that's going to blast. And, and, and this feast is a prelude to that. I, I, I venture a guess that it's not going to sound like the trumpets that we know of that that Carl and I like to, to play the nice shiny metal ones, but it's going to sound something like uh, this one, except for somebody that really knows how to make it sound like it's supposed to sound. Um, and, and the Bible says that we shouldn't be ignorant about that. And that we shouldn't live in too much concern because of that. Because you see, one day, the clouds are going to open. And the trumpet's going to sound with a shout. And remember I said that the, in, in, in numbers that the shout word can, can be interchanged there with, with the, the blasting of the trumpet. And, and, and there's, a, there's a, a kind of a, a difficulty in translation there. Well, just to cover them both, when, when, when the, the second coming is written out with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, the trumpet's going to sound, right? And the Lord himself, the Messiah, that this Rosh Hashanah beginning, the time taking us up to Yom Kippur, we'll look at Yom Kippur a little more detail next week, but uh, that this Rosh Hashanah and this trumpet sounding is to say, people, look toward God. Look to who he is, because he's coming, but we know he's coming. We, we know that he's not just out there waiting and waiting and waiting for 5,783 years, you know. He's coming again, though. When he comes again, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. Y'all know what with means, right? Just go ask, ask uh, Adam and Eve what with is. This woman you gave me, this man you gave me, and, 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 he, and he ate it with me. You know, they were with one another. Just as, just as they were together, we're going to be together. I don't know how it's all going to work. I, I don't know if I'd rather have to face the pains of death and then get to go through the part of being ris risen and put back together with a bodily resurrection. Or if I just want to watch it all happen. But either way, it's going to be glorious when that trumpet sounds that this feast points to question of tonight is, are you ready? Are you ready? There's going to be two pronouncements made when we stand before the Father. 
one of those titles that's going to be given is going to be a faithful servant who's done well. And one of those titles that's going to be given is a worker of iniquity that he never knew. Are you ready? Because that trumpet's going to blow. The trumpet's going to sound, and in the voice, the shout of the archangel, the Lord's coming back. And, and this celebration of a new year, and they had several kinds of celebrations for New Year's. I read in one thing, and, and, and just like we have new school years, new fiscal years for business, and new this, you know, they, they did that. But this was the new year. When you talk about the Day of Atonement, this was the new year that brought that to us. And when you talk about the year of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee uh, happened, uh, its observance would happen on Rosh Hashanah, uh, that that slave would be set free. And that that debt would be forgiven. Oh, can you imagine the pictures that they had that remind us who Jesus is? I hope tonight you know him. I hope tonight you've got him in your heart and you know his forgiveness. And if not, let's talk, let's visit, and let's share just a little bit about that. All right. Let me, let me pray with you, and then we're going to close down the cameras and move on to a couple other things here in the room. Let me pray with you before we do that. Father, I thank you for new beginnings, new times, new understandings of who you are, new chances to look inside of ourselves and realize that we need to repent. And we need to have a fresh start and be closer to you. Ah, oh, Father, help us to be just that, closer to you. As the new year begins among the chosen people that you picked to bring Messiah to us. Father, let it even for us be a new beginning of serving you and following you to ensure that what we say and who we are is meaningful to your kingdom and to your glory. So I pray, God, that you bless those that hear this lesson tonight. Those that have read with me from your word, how you instituted this time, Father, I pray that they'd have their trust in Jesus. And because we can trust in Jesus.